So this is an overview of what we're covering in the chapter, and like I said, I thought it was a good place to put it. So these are the processes, how DNA gets used in a cell, okay? And, and the one thing that we covered already, we talked about what's called replication. So in replication, you have uh, four bases, right? And those bases are attached to uh, sugar, right, and a phosphate. And the four bases are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. So when you look at the structure of DNA, we almost always just say A, G, C, and T. But remember, each one of those is actually attached to like a, a ring. Let's see if I can remember how this goes. So there's like a five-membered ring. Oops. And then there's a base. But that base is the A or the G or the C or the T. So let's say it's A. And then it's a, uh, let's see, it's three prime, one, two, three, O, phosphate. Um, let's see, one, two, three, four, and there's a, oh, sorry. And there's a CH2 here and another O. And then, this phosphate goes to the O that would be up here, and then it would repeat the process. And there's all this stuff that's there that we don't see. But this is the sugar. This is the base. Oh, I know my I know it's recording because I can't write. Base. And this is the phosphate. And a lot of like books, they'll just say PI like that, and it's just, it's uh, inorganic phosphate. Yeah. But that, pro that just repeats over and over and over again. So we're looking at A, T, G, and C, and, and those are used in replication. That's what we talked about last time, where the helicase comes in, makes the replication fork, right? the DNA polymerase latches on, and then you have the leading strand and the lagging strand. And the lagging stra leading strand is just made... Yeah, it's continuously, and the lagging strand is made up in little pieces, and those pieces have to be pieced back together, okay? So that's the part we covered uh, at the last lecture, is just replication. Then DNA can also be turned into RNA, and there's a bunch of different kinds of RNA. There's actually three different kinds of RNA. One of them is uh, messenger RNA, Okay, and that's when you take the DNA and you make an R, you, you base pair it to RNAs, and it uses what's called, well, what does DNA use to make its copy? DNA, it's an enzyme. DNA starts with a P, polymerase. Mm -hmm. So then when you make RNA, there's an RNA polymerase. So the RNA polymerase will take the bases, and the bases in RNA are A, U, G, and C, okay? But the sugar backbone is largely the same, except for in DNA, you're missing the oxygen that's here. And then in RNA, that sugar, that sugar, that part of the sugar molecule, the carbon number two, has the oxygen in there. And so we call DNA DNA because it's deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA is called ribonucleic acid because it has the oxygen there. Okay. So we kind of think of... Uh, in general, that these are both nucleic acids. And so the name that we give for the copying of DNA to RNA is just transcription. It's like you took somebody's notes and you're writing it, right, over. It's the same language, okay? So we call that process transcription. Uh, a medical transcriber presumably <laughs> stands in the room and writes notes, right? They're writing in the same language that the doctor is speaking in, so that's why we call that transcription, trans that's the process. Now, when you go to make proteins, okay, so mRNA or RNA, when you make RNA, its purpose primarily is for making proteins. So proteins are different language, right, than DNA and RNA, because proteins are made out of amino acids, right? DNA and RNA are made out of nucleic acids, uh, which are found in the nucleus, that's where the name comes from. And so, sorry, 
you know, it's so funny. Like, nobody ever explained these things to me when I was trying to learn it. I'm sure the teacher said it, but I just, like, totally was just like, yeah, different language. The whole thing's a different language. Okay, so, but this is the translation process because you're taking one language, the nucleic acid language, and translating it in a completely different language, which is our uh, protein language, okay? The proteins, again, there's all those proteins. There's structural proteins. There's um, uh, movement, like uh, motor, right? Proteins that are involved in all kinds of different uh, processes. Enzymes, so chemical things that they do. Okay, so, but it turns out there's three kinds of RNA. There's the mRNA, which is directly transcribed from the DNA, okay? There's ribosomal RNA. A, a ribosome is a large enzyme unit that's used to create proteins. It's the thing that puts the protein together. And then there's tRNA, which actually takes, um, and it's called tRNA because it looks, when you draw it flat, it looks like a T. At least that's the way I learned it. But it actually, the tRNA is a hybrid, just like the ribosome is a hybrid of protein and RNA. It's actually more RNA than it is protein. And the tRNA is a hybrid between an amino acid and a short segment of RNA. Okay? So these two guys work together then to make the protein and the process we call translation. And we'll cover some of the details of the things that go on when that happens. But I thought, yeah, it wouldn't be hurt to have an overview of like why we're talking about this. All right. Yeah, the way it just moves. Yeah, so a ribosome has two units. It has protein, and it has rRNA, which is one of the types of RNA, which what do you think the little R stands for? Ribosome, yeah, ribosomal RNA. Um, big unit and a little unit, and they clamp around a strand of messenger RNA. Okay, so inside the cell, inside the nucleus of the cell, right, you're going to make a copy of the RNA. You're going to get some processing done to it before it's actually used, and then it comes out of the nucleus, right? So. What I just said was trans, try to back up for a second, I'll put it on my little slide. Transcription happens in the nucleus. So DNA gets unwound, RNA polymerase makes a copy of RNA. There's some processing that gets done in there because it turns out when the RNA comes out, it has sections in it that aren't usable. And before it can be used, those sections have to be cut out. Okay? And then it goes through the nucleus, the, the wall, cell wall or the nuclear wall. It's pushed out into the cytosol. The cytosol is like the, I don't know, what do you call the cytosol? It's like the yeah, it's, this, it's the fluid inside the cell. right? And that's where the ribosomes are. And that's where the translation takes place. So this is in what we call the cytosol. Are you talking about slicing when you say like some of them has to be removed? Yeah, so they have introns and exons. And, and then like the key, right? No, that was, kind of that's, that's this transcription part. Okay. So there's actually, um, I'll get to it, but there's little bits and pieces that have to be pulled out before the enzyme can be used. Okay, so the ribosome is two parts. One part latches onto the uh, mRNA, and the other part latches around it, and, and that process starts the whole process of the translation. So, Okay, so RNA actually makes up most of the nucleic acids you find in your cells. So it's not DNA, it's mostly RNA. Uh, and I think most of that is actually found in the ribosomes. There's a lot of ribosomes. We're doing a lot of translation, okay? So, but the RNA is important because what it does is it doesn't, it's not used for replicating the cell. It's used to do the, all the operations of the cell and produce all the products that the cell needs to have for whatever function that that cell is responsible for. It still has a, ribo, it has, still has a, a sugar, which is ribose, unlike deoxyribose. 
And uracil replaces thymine in all of its functions in RNA. And generally speaking, RNA molecules are single-stranded. Okay, so you'll see when, in pictures that you'll see in biology and stuff, you'll see DNA is double-stranded. And then you'll see the, R, the uh, RNA polymerase going along, shooting out a single strand, and that single strand is the RNA. Well, DNA is millions and millions and millions of bases, because that's all your genetic information. And RNA tends to be much, much smaller. Okay. Uh, interesting, I, 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 I'm a little bit of a science philosophy kind of person. I always thought it was interesting because when you look at DNA and you look at RNA, RNA is only a fraction of the total percentage of genetic information. So when you hear stuff like that, people always say things like, well, it's obvious the other stuff's not used for anything. Until recently, and they found out, yeah, actually, it's used for a lot of things. We just didn't know what it was. So, I mean, think about science philosophy. We look at a bit of information. We come to all these really drastic conclusions. The reality is we should hold our conclusions and just try to use the information and in, in what it tells us is actually going on. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah, recently, last 10 years, they found a lot of, without all those segments that they thought wouldn't, weren't doing anything, a lot of the cell functions would take place. They're like assisting in like the productions of all kinds of proteins and regulation and stuff like that. Do you think in like 10 years you're going to have to rewrite a bunch of these like science books? Like yeah. Or like at least pick, incorrect. choose. They're not incorrect in a sense, but they are because they, they make these conclusions like, well, clearly this is old genetic information that's not useful anymore. And they, yeah. they say, well, I'm just going to ignore it all, but now it's not ignorable. And now we have to go back and look at all of it. It's kind of like when Fisher decided that. D was on the right and mm -hmm. L was on the left on the sugars. And he said, okay, D is on the right. It wasn't until like the 30s or 40s, I think it was, 1930s, 1940s, we actually had uh, structural images of the sugars and knew that it was on the right-hand side when he said D. He was just assuming it was on the right-hand side. So all those drawings, those were all assumptions based on what Fisher guessed for, the, for one sugar. And he based everything he did on that one sugar that OH group being on the right side. Mm -hmm. If he had been wrong and it was actually on the left side, we would have had to stop, put a note in every single book and said, oh yeah, you know, we discovered that it's actually on the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. And then everybody would have to look at all the old information through the lens of it's all backwards. Yeah. yeah, that kind of stuff probably happens in science or should happen in science more often. Yeah. But we, we um, as scientists, get really like, we have our pet theories. So you do experiments to verify what you believe. You see it all the time. I mean, I did it. But I was right, so it was OK. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyways. So um, yeah. So 5% of the RNA is messenger RNA. That's the stuff that gets made in the nucleus, is used for creating proteins. Okay. Then 15% of it is tRNA, the tRNA is the RNA that's used to bring amino acids together with mRNA. So it's an RNA, has a protein test, so it's a hybrid, okay? And then the rest of it is a ribosomal RNA. And that's what does all the work of translation. All right. Uh, we usually draw, so we'll talk a little bit about T on our RNA. mRNA is pretty easy to understand. It's just a strand of RNA created from the DNA, and it uses RNA polymerase. There's actually a little, like, it has to unwind the DNA and start um, the translation, uh, transcription process, but basically it, that process is the same as the replication of DNA. Okay, so T on RNA, though, uh, when you actually look at the three-dimensional shape, it looks like an L, which was always confusing to me. Um, and on one end, called the acceptor stem, it has an amino acid on the three prime end. Okay, so I'll show you a picture of kind of what it looks like in a little bit. But it works like this. So let's say this was a tRNA, and this is... Uh, this is a tRNA. Looks like an L. Literally like a... 
And this is the amino acid. It goes onto this end like this, and it gets attached. On this end of it, it has to interact with the mRNA. So it has, okay, let's say your mRNA had a sequence, and just make life uh, simple, uh, a, oh, sorry, darn it, I thought I, a pairs with U, right, and then G pairs with C. Here, here's your mRNA. So let's say it's uh, A, C, U. So there's, a, I think, three prime and five prime. And I'll just do it. I'll make a simple one like this. And there's these three amino, three uh, nucleic acids, right? On, this is known as a codon. So this is on the mRNA. A codon, and I'll get into the details of codons, a codon is just a three nucleic acid sequence that's used as the code for what tRNA attaches to it. So in the tRNA, if this is my tRNA, this is the end that has the amino acid on it. This end is the end that attaches to the codon, and this is the, called the anticodon. And so at the end of the anticodon, What do you mean the whole? Like the process with all the enzymes and everything? No, I don't think you need to know all the enzymes. You need to know, because there's, you know, like for RNA polymerase, there's like multiple RNA polymerases. Yeah. Just know it's a polymerase. And it's an RNA polymerase, and there's a DNA polymerase. But there's like RNA polymerase one, two, and three. Three makes ribosomes, I think. And yeah, you don't need to know all those details. But you need to know that there's an enzyme, and it's called polymerase that puts them together. So on this anticodon, I have my amino acid up here. Oh, so slow to draw. And then in order to properly pair, the anticodon has to have the complement to this. Okay? So the complement to this would be, on this side, it would have a U. And then C would go to G, and U would go to A. Ugga. Yeah, sorry. So that, that's what would be on the tRNA. And it would have a, this particular tRNA would have a particular amino acid on the top. Okay? Now there's some flexibility built into the system so that some of these actually, oh, sorry, I mean to point that way. Some of these actually have multiple codes that are acceptable, right? And we'll talk about that. There's a crazy chart. You don't have to uh, know the chart. The chart, give us the chart, but I'll give you the chart if you need it. Yeah. Okay, so when you flatten it out, that's the tRNA on the left. When you look at it as it's wound up, right, it looks more like an L that's kind of upside down. See this L? This is the acceptor stem, and this is where the amino acid would get attached, and this is the anticodon at the bottom. The assembly for this thing is really cool. I should have looked up the video. There's actually a video that they, they took snapshots of the protein as it was working. And you can actually see the, how the molecules change shape as these things go through. And then ha as the polymerase puts the things together. Yeah, it's really cool. Anyways. Yeah, so in the nucleus, genetic information protein synthesis is copied from a gene and the DNA makes mRNA, that's called transcription. mRNA moves out into the nucleus. This is a summary that I did on the picture before, right? mRNA molecules move out in, of the nucleus into the cytosol. They bind with the ribosome. And then tRNAs come in and pair with the mRNA, right? And the translation process takes place. Those amino acids are put together, and then you end up with a protein. Let's see. I'm gonna, I talked about this. I'm going to skip that. Um, bim, 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 bim. <sighs> what do I want to say about this? I think I said all this. Didn't I say all this? MR is Yeah. yeah.
Yeah, I'll just leave it on the slides. I, I, I write the slides and I put them together and then I tend to, tend to talk just right past them. So, I, But they're there, you can read them. How's that? Okay, so um, here's the DNA. This will give, picture, give you a picture of it. All right, DNA has to be unwound and there's a um, little pre-mRNA pre that comes out. So it actually has to be started. So there's these um, initiators that have to bind to the DNA strand, and once they bind, then the, then the transcription process can take place. And it's strictly based on uh, hydrogen bonding, the U, the A, the G, uh, the C. In this case, A goes to U, T goes to A, G goes to C. Again, the big difference between what happens in the nucleus and, uh, sorry, what happens in the nu nucleus for, trans for replication versus transcription is that we use uh, uracil to thymine. That's kind of the big difference. And then there's an RNA polymerase, and this thing just goes along the DNA strand. Eventually, it hits a terminating sequence. There's actually a, ladder, a set of uh, 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 nucleic acids that tells the RNA polymerase, stop here and get off, and then it leaves. Okay. What, what is the um, enzyme that breaks the hydrogen bonds? I don't, oh, what's it called? Bond? I don't remember what it's called. Um, I may have it on a slide. I know I read it reviewing, but I don't remember exactly. I'll get back to you and tell you if it matters. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so you would think, right, initially, that when you did this translation process, why not just have... Um, the protein come out intact, or the sorry, the the RNA come out intact. But in fact, there's two different kinds of segments uh, that the DNA codes for, and it codes for what are called exons and introns. And so, an exon, okay, is the part that contains the useful information, and the intron is what they for years thought was useless information, but actually doesn't code for the protein, okay. So we call non-coding introns. So the pre-RNA that forms includes both introns and exons, and before it can be used, it has to have those uh, introns removed. Okay? So there's actually a protein, an, an enzyme that goes through and does that. Um, so you think about it like this. There's a gene. It's a little more, well, it's a lot more complicated than this. Here's a gene. You have exons and introns. The exons are the useful parts. The introns are the not useful parts. Okay. Um, then a pre-mRNA pre -RNA comes along, and, the, and then you can process this. In, in the processing, sorry, pre sorry, let me back up. The pre-mRNA attaches to the gene, and then you get transcription. It's attached to a series of exons and introns. The pre-RNA... Uh, mRNA gets cut off, and then all the introns get removed, and the whole thing gets fused back together. To make it even more like complicated than this, I used to always think, oh yeah, so you have a gene, and a gene, when it gets uh, translated and uh, transcribed and then translated, is one enzyme. But in fact, there are you can have multiple enzymes for one start sequence. So you start. Right? And you're actually coding for many proteins that are used together, and they're all made at the same time. So this is called an operon, like on a level above this. So you have the introns and exons, but these could actually be genes for multiple enzymes. And then they all get produced at the same time. Okay? And, and that kind of thing actually makes a lot of sense because... Then what you can do is rather than starting a whole bunch of sequences independently, they're always tied together and always come out at the same time. Okay. Okay. So once you have this mature messenger RNA, which just means you took all the introns out, you took the pre-mRNA off, it goes from the nucleus through the nuclear wall into the cytosol, and this is the point where this thing finds a ribosome, and that gets produced, that gets turned into a protein. Okay. So all of this is happening in the nucleus before the production of the protein.
Um, let's see. Yeah, so transcription requires RNA polymerase. It binds to the DNA. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there's a promoter segment that has to be on there. I talked about those guys, I guess. And then I think that's I talked about all this. Okay, let's see. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just looking at the pictures. I think I talked about I'm going to skip over these. Okay, so... Um, if that's the DNA sequence, what is the mRNA that's produced from it? So what are, what's the key? What's your key? A goes to what? Oh, G goes to C, and A goes to U. And DNA, in, in, the, in the replication process, it goes to T, and you just keep putting the Ts in, right? So then... This would start at a five prime, and then it would go on because it's opposite. And then I have C, so I'm going to have a G here, and then I'll have a uh, E. Oh, sorry. A goes to T goes to U. No, T goes to A. A goes to U. A goes to U. And G goes to C. And... G goes to C, and that's the three prime, and, and this is the RNA. And the answer is two. Yeah, two. Yeah. All right. Good so far. So far. Right, next. See, I always think I'm going to go through these a lot faster, and then I close that one. All right, so um, so again, uh, go into a little bit more details about protein synthesis. Uh, what this is showing is uh, a tRNA that has serine on it. It has an anticodon AGU, and what it looks for on the messenger RNA is a sequence that says UCA, and so these will pair to each other, right? This is part of the messenger RNA. So this strand can be thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, nucleic acids long. And as it goes through the ribosome, these things will pair up and then be bonded together and then stripped away from the tRNA. Okay. So all this, this is all the processing that we were just talking about. All that stuff gets made in the nucleus, genetic information. This is an overview, uh, is encoded in DNA, is transcribed and processed into mature RNA. Again, that leaves the nucleus. That After it leaves the nucleus, it finds a ribosome, or a ribosome finds it. Remember, there's a lot of ribosomes in there. Okay, so once it's attached to the ribosome, that's the point at which the sequence of nucleic acids on the mRNA begin to pair with the tRNAs to produce a specific sequence of amino acids. That's the translation process, okay? All right. So, <clears throat> we think about DNA. DNA, you know, you have four different bases, and if you had four different bases, and each one had to code for an amino acid, I'm just going to think a little bit about math here, sorry. Four different bases. Each one had to code for amino acid. How many amino acids could you have? Four. Four. <laughs> so how many do we have, though? Oh, there's... 20, right? 20 normally occurring amino acids. So we can't have a one-to-one -one relationship between the nucleic acids and the amino acids. So try this. Yeah, yeah. if you only had one option, like, let's say A was serine and T was um, alanine, 
if that was the way it worked, right, then four nucleic acids would only code for four amino acids. Right? But if you had two nucleic acids, right, then you could have four options for this one and four options for this one. That'd be 16. Still not enough. Because there's like more than 20, really. There's actually more than 20 amino acids. There's 20 common ones, and then there's a few oddball ones. So what the what the nucleic acids, the way the nucleic acids work is that the minimum number that you could have, which is what it uses, is three. If you have three nucleic acids, four types of each, okay, then you can have four times four, which is 16 times four, you could have 64 different amino acids. But that's the first point at which there's enough codes, right, to code for the 20 amino acids that we normally use. So, when we think about a genetic code, and a genetic code has to be turned into um, a protein, there has to be some process by which this protein gets created specifically from that DNA. So once you make the DNA, and then you make the mRNA, it turns out three, each three nucleic acids is called a codon, and that codes for a specific amino acid in a protein. Okay. So DNA, RNA is one-to-one, -one, but then RNA to protein, it's three RNAs for every amino acid. Okay. We call these things codons because they code for the, the amino acids that go in the sequence. Now, of course, that means there's like 64, right? We don't, use all, we, we don't need to use all 64, but it turns out there's other things that have to be coded for. So AUG here is known as the start codon. So you would think, well, we've had 20. Well, now you need 21 because you have to know where to start, right, the translation process. And then you can't just keep translating forever, so you have to have a stop sequence. And that's actually multiple stop sequences, okay? Um, the stop sequences, and you don't, I don't think you have to know these, but these are the stop sequences, okay? Why do you need a start sequence? Because you've got to know where to start because it's three amino, it's three nucleic acids that code, right? If you don't have a start sequence, it doesn't start in the right place. Yeah, All right, right, watch this. Uh, let's see. Fat cat hat, right? If you didn't have the correct start sequence and you started here, it would be at, at, at. <laughs> Same letters started in the wrong place. So these three letter codons, right, have to start at a specific place. Otherwise, you get what's called a frame shift. You shift over and all of a sudden nonsense comes out, okay? So that's why it's important. So not only did we have to accommodate the 20 or so amino acids, we have to accommodate how does it start and how does it stop. Okay. I should have thought of something other than fat cat hat. But I do have a fat cat. That's what started me thinking. I needed three-letter words. OK. So let's determine uh, the amino acid sequence coded in that section of mRNA. Those are the codons, OK? And each three represents an amino acid. And this is just part of the code. And some of these, one of, the, one of them can change. Like sometimes the third one can be different or the second one can be different, OK? OK, so. If you were doing this one, the first one would be like pro, proline. That would be the proline here. What would this one be? Serine. GGA would be glycine. And then CUU would be leucine. But again, like if you didn't have a proper start and you started here, then you have CUA, GCG, and you'd end up getting just nonsense out. It may not actually code for the protein you want. I'm 99% sure it won't. Okay, That's the codes. So just to show you how to read this, okay, 
because it is kind of hard to read. Um, here are the amino acids, like phenyl phenylalanine, leucine, serine. Um, oh, shoot, I just realized I forgot to get your test. Sorry, I saw the amino acids and realized I forgot to get your tests. Let's just do it on Monday. All right, we'll let you, you can enjoy Thanksgiving holiday. So first letter is a U, right? Second letter is a U. It could be any of these ones that are here, or it could be a, uh, if it's this one, right? So U and U, it could be any one of these. And then if the third letter is a U, then it's like this guy. Uh, let's see, do another one. A start sequence would be like A-U-G. So the first one's A, second one's U. And then the third one is G, because remember, it's a three-letter codon. That puts you in this segment here, A-U-G. That's the start sequence. Is there a stop sequence? Yeah, here's stop sequence. First letter is U, right? Second letter is G. Last letter is either A uh, or this, sorry, is A, it's a stop, or if the second letter is a A, it could also be a stop, okay? Makes sense how that chart works? How does the last part where you said U, G, you said it's an A because... Okay, so, so let's just do like a, a, the stop sequences, mm -hmm. okay? First letter is a U, so you notice these both start with U and U. Second letter can be an A or it could be a G. And the third letter is an A. So A, A, A is a stop, and A, G, A is also a stop. So this represents the last letter in the three-letter sequence. So how did you know to pick the A rather than this, the U or the C or the G on the right side as this third letter? Like here? No, I mean like how, you know how you said the third Oh, letter. how did I pick this? Yeah. Oh, because it's for, it's, it's on this line for, these are all on this line. All oh, the third okay. letters are A. Okay. So they, the way they've sorted it, U, C, A, G, U, C, A, G, U, C, A, G, U, C, A, G, oops, sorry. U, C, A, G. This always the last letter. This is always the second letter in these columns. Mm -hmm. And then this is always the first letters in yeah. these rows. Yeah, it's kind of, it's cool though. I mean, so some of them, you can see like serine has, like serine, which is here, has two different codes, right? Um, valine has five different codes, al uh, four different codes. Va uh, alanine has four different codes. So a lot of these are coded multiple ways. So you, diff you could have, what that means is in the genetic code, you can have variation and still get the same protein, okay? which could be important. I'll let the evolutionary biologist argue that one. Okay. You want a little slop. Yeah, like... Right? A little room for yeah. like a mistake. Wiggle room. And you want to be able to have a mistake. And not have, like, a huge mutation. And have, like, death. Yeah. That's the huge mutation. Right. Because that mutation doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. So you got to have some variability, allow the genetic code to drift a little bit, I don't know, you can sit and play with these ideas all day long. Okay, I'm going to skip all these. I talked about all this stuff. Uh, I'm going to skip this. I talked about this. This is just a picture. This is the this long pink thing is the mRNA. The mRNA has these codons on it. It has a start sequence. Once the start sequence is identified, then it just starts going through the ribosome. This is a, the large and the small segments of the ribosome. And then as it goes through, these, these are tRNAs. Are like, I think they're... Vastly exaggerated in their size, by the way. Not nearly that big. Relative to the ribosome, is pretty big. Um, these come along and they get attached. They attach specific anticodons to codons, and that produces the sequence of, pro, uh, of amino acids. So what's happening out here is you're getting peptides bonding, bonds forming out here, and you're forming a protein sequence, and that's actually rolling out over here. The actual, I'll have to play the video. I didn't bother to look it up. The actual video is really cool because they showed it in like slow, it's really slowed down, but you have to think like how fast this reaction has to be. If you're gonna ge generate proteins that are like 500, or I see, 37,000 amino acids long, and you're gonna do it in a reasonable amount of time, this thing has to go really, really fast. Right. Okay.
Yeah, and in fact, the, the, in DNA and RNA, cells have ways to like identify errors and repair them. I don't understand that. I'll just say that right on top of my head there. Um, so they have a sequence. You have GCC, right? GUA and GAC. Right? What amino acid sequence do you get? So that's the mRNA. There's the codons. I should have given you the anticodons, and that's like harder because then you have to. That's like a whole step in between. Yeah. So, okay, so what's the first one? GCC, alanine. So if I'm doing three-letter codes, it's A-L-A. -A. Oh, it should be a lowercase. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. And then what's the second one? Valine, Val. And the last one? A-S-P. Gah! What's that? Yeah. I'll give you the chart. And then you have to read the chart. And I'm going to make it 37,000 amino acids long. <laughs> yeah, you could do it. It would take a long time. <laughs> it would definitely be the final because you'd be like, I'm done with this class. <laughs> oh, let's see. Oh, man, I'm just going way slower than I thought. I wanted to let you go, guys go early and... So I'm going to just briefly mention genetic mutation then. Well, okay, so a mutation is a change in the nucleic acid sequence, the DNA sequence. Okay. And it may or may not, because we saw there's some, you can have different uh, MR, uh, mRNAs, right, different sequences in the mRNA, codons and still get the same amino acid. So it may or may not result in a change in the protein that's produced. Okay? And there's a lot of ways that we get mutations. Um, one of the ways actually that I always worry about as a chemist is anything that can disrupt hydrogen bonding and has the right shape to fit in like the double helix, like flat. Those are the kinds of things that you tend to worry about. So one of the really common ones, which is really just sad to think about, is polyaromatic hydrocarbons. They call them PAHs. They're big cyclic compounds that have functional groups on them. And you get them when you burn meat. Actually, burn you burn, meat. yeah, when you burn stuff, like barbecuing. <laughs> um. Yeah, sorry. I was thinking about it you know, the way I cooked. Yeah, so when you burn, like when you're barbecuing, you get a lot of these polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And and they're, they come from the soot that's created by the cooking on the charcoal. It also is what makes it taste good and all that kind of stuff. But I always kind of worry, like, in my head that these, these paws are potential uh, agents for mutation because they fit inside your, your, the, the, uh, the DNA. They, they can just get in there and interrupt the hydrogen bonding that takes place between the two. What if you don't use charcoal? Then it's probably better. Well, sure. You could mutation doesn't mean bad. Muta oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mutation. It's a good point. Mutation doesn't mean bad. It just means different. Yeah. Yeah. Say, like if the mutation have gives you okay, but you have to really think about that. Like in the the Darwinian sense, it has to be a mutation that allows you to have more children. Which is pretty. That rare. live, <laughs> right? <laughs> Not that you just so, have more children. Yeah. Live, have some sort of advantage. And I don't know if in our modern society we get much of that. So. Then again, you could have, but definitely have genetic defects that cause like cancer and other things to take place. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is normal. Hang on. So there's different kinds of mutations. Okay. There's a point mutation when you replace one base in the template stranded DNA. This was this first one is just like normal DNA protein synthesis stuff. You can have a protein. A change in the protein when you have a point mutation, which means you just change one amino acid. And when you change the one amino acid, or sorry, nucleic acid, it suddenly codes for the wrong amino acid. It doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing happens. There's what we call silent mutations. A silent mutation takes place, no consequence. All right? Remember, proteins are pretty big. 
So it's not, not all changes cause a problem. I don't know the percentage, so that would be an interesting number. You can also have a deletion mutation. So think about what that means. If you remove one base, right, what happens? Sure. Everything shifted over. Everything that comes after that's wrong. That's, okay. that's pretty bad. And then you could have insertion, huh? That could be bad, but you know the thing about it, if it happens in one cell, if probably the cells, I would think it's probably going to be it for that cell, but if you're an organism that's multicellular, you may not, it may just get absorbed away. And then you have insertion mutations, okay? Insertion mutation does the same thing, right? You put in a new nucleic acid in the DNA, everything's shifted over by one, so you get a whole bunch of different, the codons are all different again, you get a whole different protein sequence. Or it may not even be able to replicate. It may not be able to take that replicate, that mRNA might not even translate into anything. It may not even have a start sequence in it. Okay. Can a cell lie to itself? What? Like, how does a cell, like, know that that cell is... Dead? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. So uh, th they're just trying to give you the idea of the things I just said, but we, this is what I mentioned. You have a deletion mutation. You take one out of here, you get a different code, and all of a sudden this is normal up to here, and then you had the deletion of this one, and suddenly it's coding for different amino acids. That's again, it's a frame shift. Everything's shifted over by one. You can do the same. Oh, I thought they had insertion. You could also have insertion mutations, and you take another nucleic acid, you stuff it into here, and all of a sudden this codes for, again for a different amino acid. And again, the wrong protein is created. Okay, um, let's see. Um, this is mostly what I've been talking about. So I'm going to skip the genetic diseases part, but there's so many of them that are genetic diseases. This is like one of those cells, the slides where it's like, oh, I don't really want to read this, but you should read this slide just to see what kinds of things are genetic mutation based. Okay. But like Down syndrome is a genetic mutation, CF, cystic fibrosis. Uh, the galactosemia that we talked about before, again, these are all genetic diseases. Okay. Okay, let's identify these. We have uh, A, what, what kind of mutation is it? Cytosine enters the DNA sequence. Insertion, Insertion yeah. Uh, one adenosine is removed. And the DNA change from the DNA sequence, deletion. deletion, and that kind of means that the last one's probably point mutation. What is it? Base sequence, TGA in DNA sequence, changes to TAA. So no, no insertion, no deletion, change of one uh, nucleic acid, that's a point mutation. Okay. Yay. We're so good. And be sure I want to go over this stuff. No, hang on, let me make sure. I do want to talk a little bit about these things. Um, all right, I'll go ahead and do it. This whole area called recombinant DNA, people are all in a huff about. Um, sometimes, sometimes they're not. Um, so, if you wanted to express a gene that doesn't belong in an organism, right? This is why some people are old enough about it, right? Genetically modified foods and things like that, right? Um, how do you do it? So there's a little section in your book that talks about it. It's called recombinant DNA. It also talks a little bit about DNA fingerprinting, and it kind of belongs to this section, but we'll go ahead and talk about it too. So what they do, actually, is they isolate the fragment of DNA that they're interested in, and they use what are called restriction enzymes. And a restriction enzyme just cuts out right, a section of DNA
And they, for example, open what's called a DNA plasmid. A DNA plasmid is just a little circular loop of DNA. And they insert it into that plasmid. Okay? And then they replicate that. And then what happens is they use the machinery of the organism to make that protein. Yeah, this is how insulin, like we get insulin and people use insulin all the time and it's coming from like a, what do they make it out of these days? Yeah. Yeah. So what they've done is they've taken the insulin gene, inserted it into a plasmid inside an organism like E. coli, and from that they can produce insulin. So it's kind of cool, right? And then sometimes they can induce things like uh, uh, reduce the susceptibility to Roundup, like the weed, the herbicide, and, and people don't like that. So I don't know which one it is that's really good or bad. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details about how this is done, but the idea is you take a DNA fragment and you break open the plasmid and you in introduce the the fragment, you use the same enzyme, cuts it at the exact same places, and that means the plasmid, which was circular, and the fragment of the gene that you want have the same cut ends, and they'll fuse together. Okay? So they, they, they complementarily uh, code for each other, and they'll come back together. So that's basically what this picture says, and that's why they have the sticky ends. Okay. These are all the kinds of things that are made through recombinant DNA. So there's insulin, EPO, that's the stuff we use for uh, stimulate uh, erythrocyte growth, so for blood uh, disorders, uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, uh, interleukins, which are part of your immune system, so boost your immune system. Uh, flu vaccines are made the same way. Right? There's all kinds of crazy things that are made through recombinant DNA. Okay. Uh, just so you kind of are well versed in uh, some of this stuff, when we talk about uh, PCR, polymerase chain reaction, you like you know you watch the the uh, what is it called CSI, yeah, the sciencey shows where they're like science investigators or whatever. You know they always find like this tiny fragment, and they we're gonna say, we're gonna identify who this is, and so they take that piece of material, biological material. They stick it in the PCR machine. Five minutes later, they pull it out, and they've got this huge wad of DNA, and it's identified who, they, who the culprit is. Okay, it doesn't work that, quite that easily. But what they do is you take a fragment of DNA, okay, and uh, you heat it. And when you heat it, it does just like a protein does. It sort of separates. It denatures in a sense. Right? And then what they do is they introduce primers. And remember, DNA, in order to replicate you need a primer on it. It's a little RNA segment. And then once that happens, you let the polymerase do its deal, and it, polymerase chain reaction, copies those strands. And then what you do is you heat it again, right? You have the, the uh, primers still in the solution. The primers begin the polymerase reaction again, and every cycle you go through, and literally you heat it up, and you let it cool, and you heat it up, and you let it cool. Every time you go through that cycle, you produce another copy from the previous copy. So you go from 1, right, to 2, to 4, to 8, to 16, to 32, to 64, 128. So this is an exponential growth in the number of DNA strands that you have. Okay? So you can take a very small amount of DNA, run it through polymerase chain reaction in just a few cycles, and greatly multiply the amount of DNA you have to work. So a lot of times, you know, you hear these, like, cool stories. Oh, they found this frozen animal in Siberia. We want to look at its DNA, right? They take a small sample of the DNA from the animal, and they'll take genes out of it, and then they'll replicate those and then sequence them, right? Rather than having to take the whole animal, grind it up, stick it in a bottle, whatever they do. I don't know what they do. But that's the idea, is you don't have to use as large a sample. So you can take a little piece of a tooth, pull out the DNA from the inside of the tooth, and get the genetic information for that individual from that one tooth. Okay. 
So this sort of gets us in the idea of what a DNA fingerprint is. And we didn't really talk about electrophoresis, but in, in DNA fingerprinting, what they do is they take an individual's DNA and they chop it into small pieces and then they separate those pieces on what's called an electrophoretic gel. And in the electrophoresis process, it separates the fragments based on their size and their charge, uh, amongst other things, okay? And then you get a band. The bands, this is what this guy's looking at, is a DNA fingerprint. Each one of these, they put the sample of DNA, I think they probably put it in from this top end up here. And then they run it on the electrophoretic gel, and they, as they move across, you get all these different bands. That band, even though you can't maybe necessarily identify individual bands, that banding sequence is unique for every individual. So you can look at a band like here. Let's say this is one individual's bands, these, button, these marks along here. And you can compare it to, to bands from another individual and tell, oh, yeah, this is the same person or this is not the same person. Okay, um, let's see. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, you like this? When we, when we finished the Human Genome Project in 2003, 2000, we finished the Human Genome Project. That was the genome for one person. Who was it? <laughs> Some woman, I don't know. That's all I know. I don't think, oh yeah, you know, originally we didn't know. I think maybe we do know who it was now. But I don't know, off the top of my head. We know every, out there. yeah. Some people, that's like a huge ethical thing. Unless you want people to do it. That's true. Yeah. I've heard that they're going to start doing that with jobs. Well, they could <laughs> if they wanted to, right? Yeah, I don't know. That's kind of weird. Okay, so anyways. <laughs> so the Human Genome Project was the idea that we wanted to find out every single, the, the genetics, the, the DNA sequence for every single chromosome in the human body. Like every, I should say cell, human cell. So they took one person's DNA, and what they did was they developed techniques to look at all, there's the three billion bases, and determine the sequence of every single base. Um, the guy who did a lot of the work on this, his name was Ed Young, or is Ed Young, and he's at Iowa State University, and that's where I did my postdoc. And what he did, actually, is, you know, I talk about electrophoresis. He, deve he developed a way to use what's called capillary electrophoresis, a very tiny capillary, okay? And each capillary could separate hundreds of amino uh, hundreds of uh, nucleic acids in a minute. And then what he did is he took 50 of them and put them side by side and was running 50 of these columns, these electrophoretic columns at a time. So he could do not just you know, hundreds, he could do thousands and thousands per hour. And so he had this machine set up in a room and it just was running all the time. Yeah. And he was just one lab out of many that was working on it. All right. Um, Sorry. I lied to you, didn't I? Yeah. But I got you to stay. <laughs> Let's just talk really quickly about viruses, and then we'll be done. Because viruses are cool, and they're frightening all at the same time. So viruses are small particles of RNA and DNA, okay? It has just a small number of genes in it. It doesn't have a cell wall. And they have just crazy, crazy shapes. They have what's, instead of a cell wall, they have what's called a capsid, Okay? A capsid is actually a protein. So a virus has a protein shell on it, and it has, if you look up shapes of, pro, you can just do this for fun, look up shapes of virus capsids, you see all kinds of cool geometric shapes, like octagonal shapes, three-dimensional shapes. They look, uh, some of them look pretty frightening, actually. They look like things from, um, like, alien, right? So what they do, though, what, what the virus has besides its capsid is it actually has usually a piece of RNA in it with what's called a reverse transcriptase. 
Okay, so it carries this RNA. The RNA, the capsid, penetrates the cell wall. The RNA with the reverse transcriptase comes into the cell, and it generates DNA from that piece of RNA. So it does reverse transcription. And so what it's doing is producing DNA, uh, non-native DNA within the cell. Okay. Um, let's see. So you see a lot of really crazy pictures. You think, oh, I can't look like this. is actually what they look like. They're these weird protein shells. These are the pieces of uh, RNA. These are the reverse transcriptases. And these guys basically code for the production of other foreign proteins, including the proteins used to make itself. Okay? So you think of it like the alien, right, goes into your body, begins replicating in your body, and when it's done with you, it just, you just explode. <laughs> Yeah, it's that kind of thing. Yeah, so um, this is they're talking about HIV here. HIV destroys T4 lymphocyte cells, so it's a retrovirus, infects the lymphocytes. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, these proteins need uh, to be active, uh, let's see, where is it at? I think it's on the next slide. Had it in here. I don't want to cover all of this stuff. Yeah, there's a couple of different ways that we try to stop, like viruses from um, affecting us. Uh, one is you just block the entry, right? One is you don't block the entry, but you uh, re you inhibit the reverse transcriptase, so it can't produce the DNA. And the other one, which is kind of clever, too, is you go ahead and allow it to make, right? But it turns out the, the proteins. But remember, proteins need to have usually a segment cut off for them to be active. Usually you get a, 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 like a proprotein, and you have to cut a piece of it off. They just inhibit the enzyme. It's called protease. They inhibit the protease. So those, en those proteins that get created can never be used. Okay? And then eventually the cell recycles that material. So I just think that this is a good ending slide, right? Ways or strategies for preventing, like, or, or minimizing the effects of uh, viral uh, infections is these sort of three strategies. That, wash your hands. <laughs> Do you know the new one? There's like a, a new drug on the market that's like stopping it. Yeah, I know. Oh, really? Oh, I don't know. All right, so you can read that last section. I'm done. Good Thanksgiving, guys. Have a good one.